always do that. And in fact, based on these feedback forms, which we have been collecting now for our last four weeks, we do read them, we do modify our sort of uh, uh, things that we have. Please take some time out and seriously uh, give us some, some very serious feedback. I think that this shouldn't be just thrown away or uh, filled out without uh, uh, much But we very much appreciate that. So I think probably towards the end of uh, Dr. Kali's talk, we'll start to do the feedback. And then you can hand over these feedback forms during the day or even afterwards. <laughs> already two or three times by Dr. Susan Austin, and she was primarily focusing on pretty much this range, uh, visible, reflective, and visualized. But in her graph, in her graph also, she showed you this part. And this is the part of radio waves, microwaves. So one of the amazing things is that in the optical or higher domain, you're already restricted by clouds and maybe dust storms and things like that. But if you look at this graph, it is showing you on the axis the transmittance, which is a layer of how transparent the atmosphere is for different wavelengths. So if you see here that in the microwave regime, there's a large portion which is nearly 100% open or transparent to uh, the electromagnetic waves. And this is a general frequency range used for space more radar remote sensing. So you can see that you can penetrate through clouds, that's a big advantage. Or optical remote sensing, and you can say to dust storms. And there are a lot of other things which we talk about in the future as we go forward. So, just to summarize, for radar remote sensing, atmosphere is generally transparent. Microwaves are cloud penetrating, independent of atmosphere. There is some rainfall attenuation. And that's actually sometimes used to an advantage if you go to J Road here, the big dome over the PMB office, that's actually a weather data. So that's also data remote sensing also. So we take the message that we can do data remote sensing at all times of the day because it's an active instrument, you don't need the sunlight. So you can get the same output, same image in the daytime or the nighttime, and you can do it in nearly all kinds of weather conditions. So this is just a quick chart showing you most of the current airborne and spaceborne satellites. Uh, we also have this shuttle, space shuttle based station set A, B, C and SRTM. So these are the general frequencies that you should want. So right now we don't have any uh, satellite which works in the P-band. This is coming up in 2020, I think, the biomass mission from uh, ESA. So that's interesting. But right now we have spaceborne, the satellite based L, C and X frequencies. This is, this is just a list, you can look at it later, just a list of all the uh, previous SAR satellites basically. And well, you have seen some optical examples, well, the SAR is, the problem is it looks quite noisy. So this is actual data and you know this looks quite hard to interpret, well this looks like a, maybe a, a park, this looks urban area, but this is complete, looks like complete noise. But this noise is actually very useful in some applications. But the interesting thing is, that the basic SAR data is actually uh, complex numbers. But every grid point, every pixel on the image, you have the real value and the imaginary value. Or if you remember your complex algebra, that also means you can represent it as amplitude and, and phase. So just, uh, just to remind you what complex numbers look like. And of course, you know, there's a lot of detail. I'm just going to go directly to application now. But basically, there are two or three kinds of basic uh, scattering mechanisms. 
you can have targets which have like a corner target, which always give you very, very high value because you can have multiple bounce scattering. You can have surface scattering, which is basically an area targets, spread over some large area. And you can have volume scattering where you penetrate something and then you, you have multiple scattering inside that target. So one example is a tea canopy. And one other amazing thing is that radar can penetrate through certain objects. So you can do subsurface in it. The other thing is radar basically measures surface roughness. So if you have, in this case, the ideal specular surface, the wave comes in, it acts like a mirror, goes in the opposite direction. So what you mirror is what you get back to the surface. So the basic rule of thumb is smooth surfaces always appear dark. While the rough surfaces, ideal case, the Russian surface, it gives you hydrotopic backscatter in the hemisphere. So the ideal rough surface, which is called the Lambertian surface, it will give you high backscatter. So this will be useful when we go forward and talk about some effects of water, standing water on star image. Okay, so I'm going to talk about basically uh, two applications. This is some of the research we have done, and we'll end up with some of the things we are going to do in the future. So this is a study we have just published uh, a few months ago. It's a really interesting work. Okay, so some interesting mathematics. Uh, most of you must have studied electromagnetism in your undergrad or something. So this is actually, if you remember, this is kind of very basic phenomena in those courses. If you want to study the electromagnetic wave interaction with any feature, uh, you basically have to look at the complex relative permittivity, which is basically a property of any material. So the real part is also called dielectric constant. It is a layer of diffraction or scattering. And then you have this imaginary part called loss factor, which is a layer of absorption or penetration. Generally, for Earth remote sensing targets, the imaginary part is much, much lower than the real part. Well, again, if you do some certain calculations, you know, it might take five, six pages of your notebook, but you end up with this interesting equation, which is, in effect, very simple. So this delta is the penetration depth. So the, by convention, the depth is where the intensity on the surface is used to 1 over e of the value of this. So this has certain approximations, but you know, to derive this, you have to go to some mathematics. I can give you references if you want. But what we really want to do is analyze what this equation means. So delta is directly proportional to wavelength. So it means the larger the wavelength, the more you will penetrate. Or you could say the smaller the frequency, the more you can penetrate. And penetration increases as the constant increases, penetration decreases as loss factor this increases. So actually these are also linked with moisture content. I will not go into that detail, but I'll again just summarize. From that equation, what we see is lower frequencies penetrate more. The other thing we can notice is the penetration depends upon moisture content. The more the moisture content, the more quickly radar will get absorbed, or you could say the more the moisture content, the less the radar will penetrate. So if you want to do some subsurface imaging, let's say you want to see below soil, then of course the first thing you want to choose the lower frequency that you have available. Secondly, you uh, want to make sure there is very less moisture content. So actually this is a very common figure you see in a lot of radar books and resources, where these are the, the frequencies increasing in direction. So L, C, X, L is basically around 1.2 gigahertz, C is around 5 gigahertz, X is around 9 gigahertz. So in all cases you can see the lower frequencies are penetrating more. So actually it's very interesting, we do some work on forest biomass. So if you use X band, you get scattered right from the top of the canopy. And this is very similar to optical imaging. But if you use L band, you can actually get your signal right from the body part of the tree, which contains most of the biomass. So we actually do a lot of work on biomass, but I'm not talking about it, it's not related to water. Management. But this is the probably the really interesting part that in dry soil, basically desert sand, you can penetrate down to a certain level if you use small field. And actually this is a simulation at L band, where you can see if you have very small moisture content, that's around 3%, you can penetrate nearly up to one meter. So this is a unique, unique thing, unique property of SAR, which you cannot do with optical or IR imaging. Now, I always get this question in the end, so now I put this slide in here. People ask, okay, so can we do some imaging detection or see below water itself? Well, again, if you go to your very basic electromagnetic theory and you look at what the properties of water, so water acts like a good conductor. So when you put in those things in those equations, you will find out the value you get for penetration depth is 
7 millimeter. So basically, you cannot penetrate in water itself. You may not do it. So this is a really amazing image. By the way, this reference I'm quoting again and again. This is a very fundamental book of uh, radar imaging. It's called Remote Sensing with Imaging Radar. Really amazing book. I use this in my course, so you get a hand on it. It's really amazing. <coughs> on the top, you have a color IR image. So this is sand. We have uniform texture. These are some geological rock. This is some river. But if you look at this radar image, suddenly you see something amazing. You see this channel and these tributaries and some geological features which are not visible here. These are visible because you are using a combination of low frequencies, L and C band. This can penetrate through the desert sand and find out the underlying features. So this is an example of, of uh, yeah, this is Sahara. A lot of paper, I put a couple of papers on the website also. You can check what more you can do in this domain. But I want to come to the study we have done. Uh, Abu Bakr was mentioning the first day about the Akra branch, so that's the name of the area, but actually there was a Akra river there also, many decades ago. So this is the, again, the Tolistan Desert, this is the Pakistan border, and this here is a river, which is, you can signify it by seeing the vegetation around it. But at this point in the desert, it stops. So around 100, 150, 200 years ago, it used to go through this desert, somewhere and come out on this side. So our research goal was to find out that old channel, and in geological terms it's called a Kalayo channel, or Paleo channel. It's an old dry river channel buried under sand. So what we did was we took this optical imaging, Landsat imaging, you've heard about it. So now Landsat 8 imaging actually is available on the USGS website, already calibrated, already atmospherically corrected. So you actually don't even have to go through this operation. So we got this image, we, this is a set of three images, so we do this very common remote sensing operation called mosaicing or joining of these images. Now we have to notice that these images are of different dates, but because this is a geological phenomena, so you know, even 10 years does not matter. So this is something we have to keep in mind when doing remote sensing applications. So this is Landsat data, this is SAR data. So SAR data, this is NVSAC, ASA, C-band. Ideally, we would have liked to get L-band, but there was issue some, with some issue with data availability. So we said, let's go with C-band. So this has to be processed. So this has to be calibrated. There is some noise called speckle. We do speckle filtering, then we do mosaicing and some other operations. And now you can see here, this is again a mosaic of, I think, five different uh, uh, scans over a period of one and a half month. Also, when selecting this data set, we looked at the rainfall data, and we selected the driest gear available to us. So we can, the signal can penetrate more down to the surface. So as you can see here, this is that river channel coming in. And these are some linear features which might correspond to our hidden river channel. So that was the first visual glimpse of things. Then the next step what we do was we want to do, uh, join these two data sets. So how we join them is a process called image fusion. And there are different methods. This method we are using is, is called the PCM method. So if your engineer says you already know about this here, maybe you don't, haven't seen this unique kind of application. What we do is we take the Landsat imagery. Landsat generally has seven bands. Uh, three visible, then some NIR bands. So we took three bands which were known for geological interpretation. I think it was band number three, five, and seven. So one visible, one NIR, and one middle IR band. Then we take the, do the PCA transformation. So after PCA transformation, we can pick only the first three bands. And we replace the first band with the SAR image itself. The reason behind is that the first band is actually in the PCA transformation. It is supposed to be an average value of the intensity of the whole data. So we replace that with the SAR image. So we get a new data set. We back convert it. We do the inverse transformation, come to the real space. And then we do some further histogram announcement. It's called recorrelation stretch. And then the output we have is a fused image. So now the, what we have now one image, which is a combination of both optical and SAR data. And this is that output. So now these colors don't have any quantitative value, because now we have combined them together. But you can see now that these features are exactly at the same spaces where we saw those linear features in the SAR image. So this was promising. Of course, this is not enough. There's a scientific evidence. So, Next step, we digitize them, we separate them, the visible part and the part we think 
is uh, there. The first evidence we saw was the, all these old forts there, and we know that in the last civilization, the forts were built close to the rivers. And the next step was we had some groundwater quality data uh, measurements from the ground. So this is uh, uh, soil resistivity measurements at different profile depths. We have taken 50 meter, 100 meter, 150 meter. And you can see clearly that all the uh, water level that is supposed to be, to be better quality water at all these depths corresponds quite well with our identified zone. We also had water conductivity measurement. These were point measurements. So we did some interpolation. And again, the relatively better water quality is aligning well with our identified uh, sources. Then we also plotted some wells, dry wells. They haven't had water for many, many years. But of course, this means that they did have water some time ago. So again, they align very well with our identified location. And actually, there was an old paper by Sin Harvish. He also identified some river channel. This is not an old fencing uh, analysis. He did some, I forgot what he did, and some archaeological or something. So again, so with some of his estimates, our channels align very well with that. There's an interesting thing that in India, in the documentary, it was mentioned the Saraswati River. The Saraswati River is also born, it's in India, but for India, it has a religious importance also. So one state of India two years ago, they, they dedicated a huge budget just to find that river. So actually a lot of people two years ago thought that maybe this Akra channel is also Saraswati channel. So they did a lot of study in trying to find this out. But now it's pretty much agreed that Saraswati is inside the boundary of India and Akra is a different uh, channel. So this paper is already published. I'll put it on the wiki. You can take a look. And I, what I keep telling people that Someone came to me with this problem. We said that a bird car can do this, and we did this work. So this, we now really understand this process, how to do this. If you know you want to find a video channel somewhere else in Pakistan, come and talk to me, we can see what we can do with it. Okay. The second thing we are doing related to water is basically flood inundation mapping. This is something we have, uh, we have been working with, uh, with the National Space Agency, SPARCO. Also, we've done a recent project on it. So, okay, one other thing I probably didn't put a slide here, but what happens is that when the flood inundation happens, so the water spreads over the surface, and it starts acting like a smooth surface. So when the wave comes in, hits the water, the electromagnetic wave goes in the opposite direction. So the water surface in radar always appears as dark. So actually, it's relatively easy just by looking to see, okay, this area is flooded and this is not. In practice, there are a lot more for the publication. But one of the other interesting, interesting things is that, especially for us, when we have the monsoon, we have the floods, but uh, as the floods are going on, the rain is still going on. So there are still clouds. So often, using satellites, it becomes really difficult to see where the inundation is happening, what is the current status of the rivers. So this is an example of, I think this is a modest energy. So you can see you, this is the river, and you have a lot of clouds over here. But it's overlaid with SAR, so no issue with clouds. So actually, SPARCO is now operationally using SAR since the last two, three years. To, they do use SAR in the uh, flood season, which helps in their analysis to identify an animation. So they use optical plus SAR, both of them, in uh, synonym. So this is an example where you can see this river channel very easily. The end going here. And on both sides of the channel, you can see this uh, darker area, which is actually flat. And you can see this part is not flooded. So probably this is slightly higher. And you can see again, maybe this is a dike, or I don't, I don't know this area itself. But you can see that there is no flood here. So maybe this is some high area or something. So then you can use some automated analysis to actually extract these areas. And this is actually, this is actual data Sparko used from Sentinel-1, and this is from uh, 2015. And the, if you talk about the analysis part, what's going on in the background, this is one of the maps they output for the different disaster management agencies. This is from uh, Terrasa-X. And this is, now I want to talk about the 
a bit of the processing flow. One of the interesting things was when I was working with them, we wanted to work with open source. So you can see here this whole processing flow, and this is, uh, you could say, largely automated. There's very small user input because they don't want the image to come in in the time of flood, and then you have to do the analysis from, uh, you could say, just from scratch. They want to build a methodology or semi-automated tool to do this. So this is the SAR processing part. Yeah, this is, you could call it the pre-processing, you have the image, you have to do certain processes to get to the calibrated image, and then after that there is some, you know, this this part from here to here, how to automatically extract this uh, front features. They have developed this again in this uh, French uh, tool, Orpheo Toolbox, another very good open source remote sensing resource. They've used it to come at, come at an output like this. And now what they've been doing is they've also been using an amazing tool called Google Earth Engine. If you haven't heard of it, please go and explore it. They have loads of satellite data sitting on the cloud. So you don't have to download anything. You can just access, you can access the, I think the whole last two year archive of Sentinel-2. They have a big archive of Landsat, so you just give them a command, give them a coordinate, they will cut it over Pakistan, and you can just get a stack of maybe 10 years of Pakistan over there. And by the way, there was some question about the river meandering. There was an interesting talk at last year's Google Earth Engine Summit where this guy uh, used 40 years of Landsat using Google Earth Engine, and he showed how the rivers kept changing their form. So it's not a future prediction, but it's a study of previous analysis, and maybe that can help you understand what's going on. So you can look at our blog post here, and we detail here how we actually did this, how we used Google Earth Engine. What's interesting is that at that time, Google Earth Engine did not have processing tools for SAR. So actually, these guys uh, communicated with directly with Google, and they asked them, can you put these tools in there, and they did. So it was, it was a really uh, exciting time in that time. So at, at IST, and, well, this was a collaboration I was doing with Sparko, and they were doing the actual work. But then the, I got the idea that, you know, we, for the users, maybe we need to make something which is, for which they don't need to worry about the the more sensing part or what's going on in the background. So this was an undergrad project. It's just been finished. Probably we will be finished when I go back. We have 10 or 15 more days. So this is what we call sword pin. Satellite star and optical rapid flood inundation map. The idea behind this is as soon as we get a remote sensing image, we just put it in a in a process and just take 10, 15 minutes. Just in the end, it just gives you a map of flood inundation. You don't need to worry about what's going on inside that black hole, that's, that's how it talks. So in this, we have used a combination of different softwares, and we ideal MATLAB, Visa, Snap, and we operate them using Windows command line to generate a semi-automated tool for flood generation mapping using both optical and SAR. So you can give it either SAR or optical, it will work, it will pick up either, or it can pick up both and give you the output. So this is a general processing flow, I will not, I'm not going to bore you with it. Uh, this is the Windows command line, so you can just, you know, DOS, you can just give a command here, and we have set up the everything behind it. You just give the command here, it's going to run everything behind it. Another inter interesting thing here is that, especially for the remote sensing table, is that we are using multiple softwares. So the Windows command line is, uh, file is set up in that way, it will go and do one task in NV. It will come out, then it will put that same file, the output in MATLAB, generate some product, so it goes in and out of different software. So it's like a full processing chain utilizing or commanding multiple software. So just want to show you one of the sample data we processed. This is Stellas Rx. So if you can see here briefly this is these are some dark areas. So this is these are urban areas, urban areas appear always very bright. They are corner targets. So after some pre-processing, a lot of steps in between we do simple threshold. So because the water appears dark, so in the histogram if you apply a threshold, all the dark or water areas in a different area will be separated. And then we do some post-process filtering, and we actually identify these areas quite well. So of course, this is the first prototype, and the next iteration, we want to improve this methodology, but as a first iteration, the whole chain is working. Similarly, for optical energy, currently we are, our first prototype is modest. Next, of course, we want to go to Landsat. Uh, we do pre-processing, well, MODIS actually comes in non-projected format. It does not have the latitude longitude attached with it. So we have to do some pre-processing to bring it to the grid, 
then we are using some indexes. Basically, we are using NDVI. And with NDVI, you can also separate water. So again, with thresholding, we can get the flood area out of that image. The goal is to make this tool workable for all kinds of optical data and all kinds of soil. Because if a flood is happening, and you have this standard degree cycle. So you can't wait for Landsat after 16 days. What is the good thing is available every day, or it is low resolution. So we want to make this tool that whatever data you are, you have, whatever data you can put in, it should automatically detect the type of data, and there should be a processing chain for that data. Automatically detect and select that chain, process it, and in the end just give you the user and output file with flood and emulation. So what's interesting is that this Parco has been working on this thing on their own end, and their processing has been used the last couple of floods in the, actually the Haitish in Punjab in the, in the disaster management meetings. They've been used to identify where we need to, to concentrate our industry resources. And actually one of the last time flood, uh, 2014, the government had this initiative to uh, you know, give some, uh, some compensation to the villages who came in the water. So actually, they did use satellite data to verify that. So that's something good that the you know, satellite technology is coming to use more and more in the government sector. OK, so going forward, we want to modify this prototype to run with completely open source tools. And then when it's done, we, we wanna, the plan is to, following up on our open source vision, we would like to put this on our website, and anyone can use it. By the way, there are already two tools in the world who try to work fully automatically. But they, again, they work in very specific environments. One of them works with QGIS. So we want to make it, you know, kind of format independent, just Windows DOS form. So that was our goal. But let's see how we can take this forward in the future. OK, now one other thing, this is something we have kind of started working on. It's very interesting, very important. I was talking to uh, Dr. Arvin about it. And it's something very complicated, but very important also. I don't know if some of you have seen in the news a couple of years back, there was this news that Karachi is going to sink in 50 years. Do you remember seeing that news? Yes, sir. So there was a big issue. There was discussion in the Senate and the Parliament. Well, we, the newspaper like to give headlines. So it's not going to sink per se, but there is an issue. The water, the sea water is rising, and we don't know if the land is subsiding or not. There are some other factors as well. So this is the Indus Delta. We talked about this basin, but let's come down to the ocean where the, the water actually goes into the ocean. So this cold part, the white part, this is in this delta. Okay, so I'm gonna cite this paper again again, it's a very important paper from Jim Sivitsky. It's in nature, geoscience. Uh, really interesting paper, why you to take a look at it later. But here he has this uh, map, elevation map of the Indus Delta. And you can see here that near the coast, a lot of regions are actually below sea level. They are at zero is your sea level, and they are actually below sea level. So already water is sea water is including here. And again, if you go back and look at this historical channels, this is the has identified the blue channel for 1947 and that and that. So in these years, there were a lot of river channels that were coming out and falling into the ocean. So what happened is that when these rivers come and fall to the ocean, they bring with them a lot of sediment load. So this delta is being continuously replenished with that load. So this is kind of like a balance created, and the seawater that has the energy and the waves, it cannot erode or cannot take over the land. But fast forward to, I don't know the year of this impact, but this is quite recent. So right now, because of all our garages and dams and everything, only one channel actually goes out to the river. So the sediment load being carried out downstream is much reduced. And of course, a lot of the sediment is sitting in our dams, as well as the villa dam also. So the end result going downward is much reduced. So that's already causing, uh, you could say, a danger to the industry. And if you look at this again, this is a very interesting table from the civil state paper. You see delta the data is where the reduction in aggregation no longer exceeds relative sea level rise. So because this was a, was a balance, sea level rise is increasing, the sediment load is decreasing. So our index delta is at greater risk. And if you see here, okay. 
subsidence from water, oil and gas mining. So he has created miner, but it is not known. It is an unknown quantity. So there are multiple factors at play. One, the sea water is including. The land could be subsiding. We don't know. We have some idea about the sea level rise. We don't know about the whether the land is subsiding or not. And even if it, if it is subsiding, what is the subsiding rate? So Jim Sidetsky student who was, well, Jim Sidetsky was at CU Boulder, was studying, and his student Stephanie Higgins who was working with me, and we did something together. She was the first one to come out with a paper which actually used a specific SAR technology called interferometry, which can actually measure very accurately the subsidence rates of uh, land. So she was the first one who did it for a delta. So she did it actually for the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta in Bangladesh, and we all know Bangladesh has a lot of region which is very close or actually below sea level. So now these uh, black dots, black data sets actually report from the GPS instruments on the ground, being there since many years. And then these uh, red points are estimated using satellite, using SAR. Now we have a lot of water people sitting here. In both of these data sets, you see this area is relatively stable in the long term. This area is uh, changing in its elevation, so it's subsiding probably. But in both of them, you see this sine wave-like features. Can anyone guess what are these representing? Somewhere in the middle. Okay, that's good because you have been able to see that this is seasonal, right? So that's one good first step. Can anyone try to guess why they are moving? Okay, close. Try, try again. So this is basically a combination of the drain and groundwater cycle. So the groundwater, you pump up groundwater, the land is going to sink slightly. So it's really amazing. There actually papers were been able to identify the groundwater cycle just by using SAR. Well, this was not the aim of this paper. So actually, there's, if you look at the Higgins paper, he already cites one paper who studied this phenomena here of the groundwater cycle. But in, in this paper, the major issue is to look at this long-term trend. So it's really, you can see that at one station, is relatively stable in the long term. Other station, it is uh, subsiding in the long term. Yeah. And these are the seasonal cycles. So this is then the final end in the map. And you can see here the uh, units where this area is actually just, uh, it's changing a lot. And then the, all the green areas are the blue areas. And some of the green areas are directly stable. So this was done in the Bangladesh Delta. However, what we want to do is do it in the Indus Delta. And this is one of the projects which I, as a PI, have gotten with the JAXA Space Agency. We want to use ALOS Balsar, which is L-band SAR. So there is a reason why we ought to use L-band and not C-band or X-band. It's a complication. But basically, in river deltas, we, we, they, everyone is recommended to use L-band. And we are collaborating with PCRWR. And they, uh, interestingly, they, all, they already have a big network of piezometers in the Delta region. So they have a data of around six years. Uh, the readings are like not very temporally intensive. They're, I think two or three times a year. But at least we'll be able to see some kind of pattern in those readings. So this can serve as a calibration or validation source for us. So this is not something we have done already. This is in the plan. We already have access to the data. But I want to finish my previous project first before I start on it. So hopefully, maybe next year, I can show you some updates. And always, I get this question in the end. The SAR data is not available. You know, just, so this is not actually true. This has changed recently. I want to quickly go over this. Of course, Sentinel-1, available Sentinel-1, A and B, both are operational. Last two years, data are available. You can get them. Just click and download, like Landsat. Uh, also. All of the previous data of PRS and NVSAT is now available. Well, with some caveat, the policy is made, the data is slowly being uploaded to the system. So I think NVSAT is all available, PRS is coming up, might happen in the next few months. But this is amazing. You can just go here, just register, download this EO Lisa software, search, click, download. Now, with TerraSelect and MX, slightly difficult, but they have regular scientific proposal calls. 
You can submit a proposal, and generally they are very happy to give you data. Also, they have one, I think, open proposal all the time for archive data. If you look at the region, if you look at the archive, you have data there from, let's say, 2002 to 2006, you tell them immediately they will be able to give you data. With this proposal call, what should be interesting is that sometimes you can uh, order them for future data. So, for example, in my EGOS proposal, I have the option to, there is a certain number that I can tell them, get me email from next month, June. So that's for special application, but you know, starting with SAR, you can of course start with archive data. So with ZeraFedEx, Tandemac, there's also a lot of possibility of getting data. Even then, you can also pay for data and the scientific cost is very less. The actual one image might cost is around 1,000 euros. If you order for research, it's only around 100. If you order more images, you can even pay a discounted rate of like 80 euros. So, and with JAXA, they have a proposal call nearly every two years. But again, if you can hit that proposal, they can they will give you nearly whatever you want. So wait for that. And Cosmos SkyMed is a bit difficult. Italians they <laughs> like to promise, but they don't like to share three months. <laughs> I think you agree with me. Yeah. yeah. Even when I was doing my PhD, my professor tried to get data. He had some collaboration with some universities, but they said, sorry, we can get data. But anyway, but what's really interesting is last two years, they have suddenly started to open up. So this, this agency, the ASI agency, they have actually put a call to, to again, it's a proposal, what you want to utilize it for. So I haven't tried it myself, but maybe you want to take a look at it, because CSK is really unique, because it has four satellites who follow each other in one orbit. So this is a very unique uh, SAR constellation. Then there is DataSat. Again, you have to look for proposal calls. But I think there's new setup coming up called the RCM, DataSat Constellation Mission. I think it, it will have relatively more open data policy. And I will invite you to go into really amazing. It has a lot of application of what you can do with SAR. Not only water, a lot of amazing things. Take a look at it. And I asked. Abu Bakr is so that would allow me to do some advertising. Uh, well, it's, I only have 40 minutes, so I can't teach you SAR. If you're interested, you want to learn more, I'm running a summer school from 10 to 18 July. So it's an extensive summer school on SAR. This year has even extended into seven days from five days. So seven days, I teach you a lot of SAR. We also do hands-on work. So if you're interested, just take a look at our website and register, and I'll be happy to see you in Islamabad in July. And just to give an overview of what we study there, major modules, imaging data, what is how does data image, and then what is SAR? SAR, synthetic parts of data, what does this synthetic term mean? We talk a lot about that. Then we talk about the errors, dramatic distortions, then the big part, how the, the like I briefly mentioned that the water appears dark in certain images. So how does the issue ocean look like? How do forests look like? All these things we study in detail. Then we talk about application, then some advanced things. We we'll have a lot of hands-on modules, and I think Stefano will be happy to see. I put a big module of activity there. So if you want to learn more about activity, that's also included somewhat in this summer school. And this is an image of Chita Bhatti Forest. I put there to let you know that we do what in SAR in Pakistan also. So thank you. That's all from me. Any questions?
Is it working? Yeah. Okay. So this this river is now in its uh, now in Gagar Hakra River. Uh, but due to this river, uh, actually what had happened previously or even uh, today, a uh, lot of researchers are using digital elevation models. And, uh, and uh, due to this river, it is ending up in, in, in open area. So. Uh, the digital elevation model, if someone is using for water state delineation, it is not ending up at that very point. So what has, uh, what is happening if you are using digital elevation model in particular? So it will end up, it will connect the Indus River with, with this Gagarhatra River, and uh, one will take poor estimated boundary. And unfortunately, for for the Indus Basin, I, I can quote the. Uh, the overestimation is ranging from a few hundred kilometers to 400,000 square kilometers. So the, the overestimation is quite significant, and a lot of prestigious institutes are, 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 are making this mistake by overestimating the boundaries. So remote sensing is basically a, a good tool to be used, but uh, hand on it is uh, it's also necessary. Uh, so once you use remote sensing data, and knowing the constraints and, and the basic frequencies and biases within, within the data set. So this is from my, my end that um, everyone should use remote sensing data set in various ways, but they should know the constraints and the limitations and, uh, and the uncertainty in the basic raw data set. Thank you. Just to ask you uh, more about uh, uh, this uh, topic, that uh, when I started uh, working with the most sensing, uh, this technique uh, was limited uh, to the people in the academic uh, sector. And, and now you see that uh, and, uh, what the objective was only to publish in a paper or on the scientists to see what we could with the remote sensing. Now we have an example that with the remote sensing we can provide to the society some answers. So I think that the new generation of scientists uh, has to be more, uh, uh, let's say, involved uh, in the solution of the problem. Because uh, the algorithms exist. I, I think that uh, we don't need to uh, work more on the algorithm, but more on the expectation. And especially the, the possibility to, to have a, a multi-sensor approach, like the Schubert, no optical, rather, that can be used at the same time. So in my, in my opinion, we have a, a, a good future because uh, the Copernicus program in Europe will ensure uh, radar and optical data for the next uh, 20 years. I encourage the students here to, let's say, uh, follow uh, this uh, area of uh, scientific uh, investigation. Yeah, I, I totally agree that the future is uh, using the suite of instruments we have to answer the problems, not saying. A lot of it is because a lot of the pre-process is, is being done by the agencies. And, you know, where we used to spend, you know, months and months and months to, to get the data to a place where we could actually use it, that's been more or less being done for us. So we we have now moved away to, from from just simply trying to say, can I figure out what I'm looking at, to, to actually using the data in the models and in, in actual. Uh, answering questions that people want to know. So I, I think that's true. The, the advice for, you know, for, for the cell idea, knowing the constraints and everything, that, that's just a general advice for scientific data of all kinds, because any measurement system has problems, it has limitations, and you simply have to be aware of them. 
but you know, a lot of the drudgery of our lives is kind of the same that's now gone, so we can actually do some of the more interesting science, I think that's the future. Yeah, that's what I think about the future. Yeah, that's what I think about the future. I just want to add, I've been working in the ocean in, in air for like eight years since my degree, master's degree. So what I think is that, you know, we have a lot of people in Pakistan who now who can handle optical data. But I think it's time to now, of course, optical data is important, but to move beyond and I mean, SAR is one thing, but I really think ultimately is that, that thing. I mean, with ultimately, all the data is already available. That is, we don't even have to register. Just go to the website, click, and download it. So, you know, this is something me and Stefan have been talking about that I'm trying to start an ultimate research group in my institute, but I have issues that I have to handle SAR also. But. So, I, I think ultimately is the next thing. There's so many applications now, starting from coastal monitoring to waters in the rivers. I was just telling someone today that uh, in Bangladesh, they have already implemented operationally using IT meters to monitor river levels, and that actually means to monitor floods. So they have these monitoring water stations at the at the higher elevation, and they can get an advanced six to eight hour warning downstream the flood. So if you actually look at the stats in Bangladesh, they have reduced the damage due to floods drastically in the last few years. Now floods have not stopped coming, you know, that's not happened. It's just if uh, Many things better, they use these tools better to understand and study things. So I mean, if Bangladesh can develop and use ultimately to develop these tools, so there's a good example for us and we can do it. So this is just an icing on the cake to encourage you to start doing ultimately. So.